BlizzCon 2021 happened a few days ago. Now, given the distrust most hold against this company and its partner in crime in this sack of shit, I wouldn't blame you for not knowing that this ever happened at all. But that's okay. It doesn't really matter. Far more interesting than the continuous stream of overpriced swill emanating from this thing was what happened on the Twitch stream during this event. Those who tuned into the Metallica, quote, a concert, end quote, were initially greeted with several aging husks of boomer flesh stumble upon the stage, who I am informed were actually Metallica. As they strummed the opening chords to popular tune, Pour Some Sugar On Me, the Twitch stream uh, got a little wacky. Automated copyright systems detected the use of copyrighted music being played on the official Twitch channel by a band who owned the music. A band that has garnered notoriety for fighting against consumer rights and general copyright jiggly-poos. Call it karma, call it a bad case of the Wednesdays, but the internet laughed and the internet cried and we all moved on with our lives. But this got me thinking about how the world ever entered this state. Granted, this is just another day in the dystopian future of 2021. I've already made a whole video that was mostly about copyright before, but in that video, I never really delved specifically into music and music copyright law. You're probably aware that music copyright has always been a pretty iffy thing for content creators. Surely streaming a few seconds of a game soundtrack that just contains licensed music shouldn't warrant legal action. Yet, here we are. Something I've heard very often is why don't the government fix this? Why don't the government step in and tell these companies, no, no, that's bad. Well, see, they could, but they, they don't, and they won't. See, here in the US of fuck you in the A, there's a little stipulation in US law that allows a crossover of the corporation in governmentation worlds. A large company can send money to special interest groups and lobbying firms, or straight up just donate to an acting political figure. Why would you want to do this? Uh, this, it's, it's a bribe. It's just a bribe. It gives major incentive for the politician to propose bills that would benefit their, uh, beneficiaries. And yeah, while most of the time this comes in big buckets of cash, sometimes it's a position in the corporation if that acting political figure gets uh, kicked out. As I've said, it, it is bribery, e even according to the dictionary. So you might be wondering, why is this very illegal act still legal? Well, because they just changed the word. That's it. You might remember recently there was a proposed bill to send any streamers of any copyrighted material to jail. So accidentally playing a game that just has a radio station could get you thrown in the big house. It was outlandish, and certainly not in the public's interest, but the senator that proposed it, yeah, this is what happened. The entertainment industry just threw a, a couple bucks at him. Yep, that's it. This isn't uncommon. In fact, most laws and strange stipulations of the legal system exist solely because of these bribes. And while the copyright system and everything else I'm going to talk about today could easily be fixed, it won't. Now, in regards to this affair specifically, it really was the advent of digital audio that put fear into the hearts of the recording industry. See, back in the day, music and sounds were recorded onto a physical object, whether it be a big old cylinder, a flat cylinder, a square-shaped cylinder, whatever. The information on these mediums were little bumps and grooves that emulated the sound waves naturally carried through the air. And when connected to these fancy machines, the sound could be replicated. Wow. Bam. If you wanted to copy the information to another disc or groove, it would come at the loss of some quality. If you played the recording back too many times, natural wear and tear would do its thing and quality would also be lost. This made it so record companies weren't too worried about any potential copies being made of these songs. But see, when it comes to digital audio, it's an entirely different beast. It's all defined by information. There would be no potential wear and tear over time. And most importantly to the industry, this could be duplicated infinitely 
without loss of quality. Yes, this was very concerning, especially to the RIAA, or the Recording Industry Association of America. This group contains the biggest players in the music industry, and most problems that you might have with audio copyright can be traced back to them, or at least one of its members. Now, I'm not gonna lie, this group is is shit. And this makes sense when you consider that it's an organization filled with people who literally have no talent other than exploiting other people. And when you get a group of these kind of people together and you give them a bunch of money and lobbying power to influence laws, it's gonna get bad pretty quickly. So as digital audio was entering the forefront and actually becoming affordable to the average consumer, the organization started to flex its muscles a bit. See, Sony had produced a digital audio tape format in the late 80s. It looked like a cassette, yeah, but the information on the tape was entirely digital. Problem was that this was on the cusp of being cheap enough for average people to actually start buying it, which would mean potential duplication issues and well, we don't want that. The RIAA wanted to stop this before shit got real. So they went to Congress and they were like, hey, so this thing here, we don't like it. it digital, digital is, is it's bad, it's a fad. So if you don't mind, can you just ban this format? And Congress said no. After all, it might look a bit suspicious if Congress just bans a new media format for reasons. So the RIAA went home and thought up a new plan. After a good night's sleep, they returned to Congress and asked for something else. They said, hey, so if you can't flat out ban this thing, I, I get it. So, you know, you could just make it make it garbage. You know, you could kill it without killing it. And we know how you can do it. You put in this egregious copyright system that needs to be mandated in all recordings and devices that use this format. And even worse, place a tax on everything regarding this format. And you know what? We want the money. So place the tax on it and take that tax money and just give it to us. In Congress, they said yes, and the product died right then and there. This made digital audio pretty irrelevant for the decade, at least for most people. Now, while you might think CDs were a bigger concern, since, you know, they were going to be a big old thing, copying a CD wasn't quite as easy as it is today. CDs held quite a bit of information, and transferring all that data was going to be a problem. CD players also weren't particularly cheap, so this wasn't something the RIAA would be targeting anytime soon. But not all was good. Even though the industry had got its win, it's hard to say it was on stable ground though. It was apparent to everybody that digital audio would return one day, and when it did, you, you couldn't stop it. Even if piracy wasn't going to be a major issue, there was another aspect of digital audio that was incredibly frightening to these companies. Since you could listen to this music as much as you wanted and there would be no degradation of sound quality, there would never be a reason again to rebuy an album. Once you own the song, you and pretty much everybody you know would own the song. And with this fear in the back of their heads, a lot of really wacky shit started to happen. Because when something's about to die, you know, it's gonna flail around for a little bit until, yeah. And it wasn't just specifically the RIAA either. It was the entire industry. In 1996, it was revealed that the, the A ASCAP, or American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, had sent letters to the Girl Scouts demanding royalties for singing songs in public areas. It went about as well as you could expect. While ASCAP had claimed that it was a public relations nightmare, and they tried to kind of almost apologize, this was all true. They did actually send letters, and they did expect compensation for from the Girl Scouts. The only reason this was changed was that public outcry. And that's not even the worst of it. In 1999, led by RIAA lobbying, specific phrasing was shoved into a random bill that would denote all music recordings made as 
work for hire. This would effectively mean every song ever written would not be owned in any capacity by the original artist, but instead the publisher. Once it was discovered, you saw another public outcry, and this forced the hand of the RIAA. After all, it was unlikely any artist would ever sign with a label again if they knew this was the kind of shit that was going on. And fun fact, the CEO of the RIAA went on to do pretty much exactly what you would expect after leaving the recording industry. That's right, she went to work at CNN and become a political commentator. And she also bought half a million Twitter followers. Yep, that's the world you live in. Now, most people were interested in the DMCA around this time, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which again, I've talked about. And while in some ways the DMCA benefited the recording industry, it was a... It was a fickle thing. When you get a bunch of old people together to write laws about things they don't know about, weird shit happens. And lucky for us, some of that weird shit would benefit the consumer. This came to fruition when digital audio started to come around again, this time in the form of MP3 players. And as you would expect, the RIAA was back to its old tricks. Yep, they went to Congress and they tried to do the exact same thing that they did to that digital audio tape to MP3s. But this time, there is specific phrasing in the DMCA that allowed these to survive. Basically, they had no recording functionality, and so it would be hard to justify banning the product if, you know, it's just for listening to music. The world was briefly ecstatic by this news, at least I assume so. See, music was fairly close to becoming a very different medium during this era. Now that songs could be owned digitally and shared across the web, a new mentality emerged as music is something of a public good, like roads, the library, or trees. In this era of peer-to-peer -peer sharing, any song could be at your ear tips in a few moments, for free. But this came with a few caveats. Peer-to-peer -peer sharing isn't always the most legit thing in the world. Sometimes some little prick over there will just upload his malware or mislabeled tracks to get their jimmies in a bundle. User interfaces weren't particularly clean or friendly to new users, even by 2000s internet standards, which is really low standards. But then, Napster. See, Napster was like music pirating, but everybody could do it. And they did do it. It garnered a huge audience very quickly, and it did it by just making the experience more convenient. Now I can see some of you frowning your faces and saying, well, the musicians of the era, they probably didn't like the idea of some jackass stealing their music, right? But in this time period, it was actually kind of a blessing for most musicians. See, to get discovered by a large audience in these days was nearly impossible without the backing of a major label. Major labels that just tried to put in that fucking work for hire thing. These labels are essential because they manage promotion and advertisement and effectively can make you a star. It's why many pop artists don't actually write their own music. They're simply a face picked by a label to play music made by somebody else for the sake of profit. And in this sense, it's not an even playing field, obviously. And many musicians would have to sell out to make a living making music. But when all music is free and on the same platform, well, the tables shift. While getting discovered still wasn't and isn't the easiest thing in the world, it was finally possible. It didn't necessarily matter if money wasn't flowing in from pirated downloads, at least a fan base could be built up. And while independent artists liked this, major artists did not. Because, well, they, they were losing some money. Surprisingly enough, the RIAA didn't seem to hit Napster the moment it went live. And that's more than likely because they were old and they didn't know how computers worked and they were more concerned with uh, being pricks. Anyway, back to Napster. It was flourishing with indie artists and big artists alike all being more popular than ever before. And it was all hunky dory hooray until it wasn't. As the story goes, Metallica members were sitting in their local steam room rubbing each other's members when they get a call from their agent. He's like, hey, your new song, it's on the radio. 
The band members were confused at first. They had no new song. They didn't even know how to play instruments. After a quick check, it turned out a demo for the upcoming Mission Impossible Dose was leaked onto Napster and picked up by several radio stations. The band members quit rubbing each other's penises at once and said, Who is this Napster? said Fucky the bassist. I don't know, but it sounds like they're listening to our music without paying the shekels first, said Prickle. The band demanded retribution, restitution, and fast. So being the true fight-the-system punk metal heroes they aspired to be, they went straight to their lawyers. Now, the lawsuit of Metallica vs. Napster was quite an interesting one for a number of reasons. Most famously, the band had hired a firm to track the names of each person who downloaded their songs illegally and presented them in court. Now, this wasn't the best look because, well, (laughs) they were literally attacking their fans. The same fans were likely the only ones still interested in Metallica. The public wasn't too happy about this. Metallica had done fucked up. Not only did they go after Napster, which to many was the outlet for small bands and the basis of music as a public good, but they named names. They valued money over the fans, but Metallica cried foul. They said, no, we were the victims. Our beautiful music was being listened to by people without financial compensation. Didn't matter, the damage was done. It wasn't just Metallica in this lawsuit. Dr. Dre, who was best known for running a scam organization that sold shitty headphones for exorbitant prices. So, uh, yeah, what a gang. Napster lost the case, as you probably already know. It was forced to shut down after removing copyrighted content. Music would not be, nor would ever be, a public good. Which is tragic, but it's not that surprising. Something that should be noted about all this is how musicians make money. Most money doesn't come from streams or listens or whatever. It comes from concert tickets and heavily inflated merchandise. So yeah, peer-to-peer still remained a relevant force. Napster was just the one that got too big for its good. People would continue pirating music, and I assume they probably do it today. But for those seeking more legal means of music, we would see the birth of a digital storefront. Yup. And if anything signals the end of the record industry's terror over legislation and politics and its monolithic hold over the industry, it was right here. Yeah, see, lobbying generally requires a lot of money, but it also requires that you have the most money. By the 2000s, the recording industry began to look pretty weak compared to the behemoths of tech. With Apple and Microsoft jumping into the fray, the RIAA couldn't really just pay off a few senators to get what they wanted. I mean, if they did, Apple and Microsoft would just be in there. Bam! Digital audio was a thing. The floodgates had opened, and the RIAA lost what it wanted most. Control. Control that would get you money. On iTunes, you could buy a single song or a whole album. There was some element of choice there. If you had a computer, you could just go to the library and grab a CD and just just download all of it. Because fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. This doesn't mean the RIAA was done flailing its arms about completely. They notoriously charged many people with music piracy charges during this time. Problem is, they couldn't really back up the claims. They would get some money in compensation just by taking people to court, but they would also just charge dead people with music piracy or kids or people that didn't even own a fucking computer. If I had to take a guess, I think they were just going through the phone book and picking random names. One of the funnier things they tried, though, was they wanted to convince the public that they should pay more for CDs. Yeah, and as of late, they found a slow decline into relative obscurity, and then streaming, and then SoundCloud, and then YouTube, and then now you can just make money and not even go through a label. So, uh, but of course, they found a way. They found a way to, 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 to just stick it to you one, one last time. How this generally works is an automated system will find the frequency of of whatever you have in a video or a stream and try to match it to a song. And if it does it, they'll just hit you with the copyright claim. Now, usually all of this is within fair use, so it's not a valid claim, but they know you don't have the money to fight them in court. 
there's really no rules when it comes to an industry like this. As you may remember, there was a long-held copyright on the Happy Birthday song by Warner Music. This would mean royalties would have to be paid every time it was sung, and it would never appear in TV shows, and they do some, you know, it's almost happy birthday. Okay, and you smell like one, two... <laughs> it turns out, Warner Music never owned the rights in the first place. Yeah, it should be painfully clear just how bad the recording industry is. I mean, this is just a brief snippet of the corruption and evil deeds that this group of evildoers has done. They spent all of this time fighting for money and control, but I think it was a double-edged sword. They're not in a great position now. I think it's going to get a lot worse. Okay, so here's what. See, exposure can be a good thing, but overexposure is a really, really bad thing. Go watch a set of TV ads, and you'll find the same songs used and reused and reused for 40 fucking years. Breathe. because of how music is licensed. When you license a song for use, which means you won't get sued over copyright, it costs money, a lot of money. And the only way to ensure that this investment pays off is to go for the widest reaching, broadest appeal, bottom of the barrel content. While you might assume that this is pop music of current year, this isn't actually the case. Pop music only appeals to younger demographics, not mass audiences. So what do mass audiences like? Nothing, really. I mean, music tastes are so drastically diverse compared to what they were in the, you know, ever before. But one genre has remained universally recognizable, and this is your 1980s rock. Yes, look at studies of most popular genres of music, and you'll find that rock right up there. Rock music vastly changed after the 1980s, spreading out into new alternative subgenres. These all vary drastically in who they appeal to and the age demographics. If you go too early with rock, you get music that might seem antiquated to those Gen Xers. And this means to target all marketable demographics, the most ideal music for advertisers and licensing use is 1980s rock and metal. And I guess, uh, this Black Sabbath. This is why these songs are still being used after so many years. And yes, it's been a lot of years. Enough time has passed that using a 1980s rock song for advertising and licensing would be like using a 1930s song for advertising in the 70s. It, it just wouldn't happen. And they can't change it because no alternative exists because nothing else has that assured wide appeal or recognizability. As such, these songs have become anthems of advertisement and licensed content. And it's with no younger generations having a positive association with these these bands in this genre, this entire collection of music will fall into obscurity. And this is the strange thing about what these record labels have done to copyright law. They've dug themselves into this hole. It was all about short-term gains to protect interests in the here and now, but a lot of it came from a failing to predict how people would actually consume content in the future. Nowadays, licensed music is effectively contraband to content creators, to the largest sector of media, to the largest sector of media to appeal to these groups. This means that bands like Guns N' Roses and Metallica will forever be stuck as cringe corporate rock. And it's only a matter of time before they are a distant memory. As time goes on, this problem will only get worse. So while the consumer has taken a hit or two, and it might seem like the darkest of realities, this is one with a silver lining. The system that they have made seems to be destroying them. 
That lifeblood of the recording industry, these works, is now a limited resource. They shut it in a vault, and now it's just gonna rot away. And so that whole BlizzCon Metallica situation, it's just a real-time manifestation of all these events. Metallica, much like the recording industry, doesn't understand what's going on. And they never will. So yes, for whom the bell tolls indeed, Mr. Metallica.